Hello everybody. So we don't have to introduce ourselves. You might know Greg and me. Or not. Or That's not. Okay. We're, anyway, okay. it doesn't matter. Just one thing. Uh, there is two hashtags. So if you can use these two to make some noise on Twitter, it would be great. So first, why are we here today? Why Greg and me are on the stage right now? So the last 12, 18 months, we got more and more requests from clients and partners regarding e-commerce integration. So clients and partners are looking for the best practice. And as Greg and I are not e-commerce experts, uh, well, we did some interviews of our partners. We asked about the references, how they solve e-commerce integration, what were the issues, what was the solution? So we have to thank three partners, OpenMind, Priocept, and Tricode. They, they told us what they did in the project. project sorry. And sorry for the other, we are not able to call all of you. But the conference is a good place to, to share and to speak about the topic. So feel free to come to us later or tomorrow. And the outcome of, the, um, of these interviews is that uh, Partners are looking for a, a standard approach. About e-commerce, they said that it's not developer-friendly and uh, also not user-friendly. And as I said, yes, they are looking for, for the best approach. Also, before giving you best practices, uh, with Greg, we wanted to try uh, an e-commerce in e integration for ourselves. And you will see later a demo. So now we can start. So first, we will ask a question, why e-commerce need CMS? Then a short demo, and we'll finish with some patterns, patterns and pitfalls. So yes, why does e-commerce need CMS? E-commerce is great for catalogs, shopping cart processes like payment, checkout, delivery. E-commerce is great for all these things. But pitfalls of online shops. So one main pitfall is that uh, they often behave, uh, they create shelf in which they put random products. Uh, we read an article from Thomas Bechdal, and he said, most brands completely forgot sales when creating a web shop. Instead, they create shelf in which they put random products this shelf often look nice, but it would be foolish to think that this would work. So this was the starting point of our reflection. E-shop are more like supermarket. But you, as a shopper, you expect uh, a, a better experience. You should be engaged. And so you are more engaged to, to buy something in a nice place. You want to be able to shop from your mobile without any disruption at any time from anywhere and you are not like the other <laughs> yeah you are not like the other and uh, yeah so it's all about personal personalized experience eShop should provide accurate suggestion based on your profile so e-commerce are good for uh, it's a great engine but content is a key. And because of, of the lack of good CMS feature in e-commerce, as I said, or as Thomas Bechdal said, <laughs> they create shelves in which they put random products. And everything is about user experience. This is why e-commerce need CMS. So now about user experience, how to make your client happy. We think that, or <laughs> we assume that in uh, e-commerce organizations are two main teams, the digital marketing team and the e-commerce team. And in our approach, so it, what you will see today, we, want to, we wanted to focus on the, in, on the hipster guy, so on the digital marketing team. And so to make your customer happy, he needs a good user experience. And to provide a good user experience, the editor, so, the, so this guy behind me, he needs the right tool. 
So that's why in our approach, we focus on the ease of creation of all these things, marketing campaign, landing page, enhanced product page, and of course, personalized experience on multiple channels. We didn't want to rebuild all the features of the e-commerce, but to focus on their weakness. Of course, you can think that, yeah, why we should do that? Because any e-commerce provides already all these things out of the box. Yes, it's true. But just try to create a website from scratch with e-commerce is close to <laughs> to that. Come on, <laughs> creating a website with e-commerce is like this. More like it's a nightmare, <laughs> and that's why we wanted to help e-commerce with great editorial tools. So before jumping into the demo, uh, I would like to thank another partner, Webtizer. So they help us with uh, Ibris integration. Why Webtizer? Because they are Ibris partner, and they have a lot of knowledge in Ibris, and we don't have this knowledge. And also they are from Zurich, and it was quite convenient to meet them. So now I will jump into the demo, but first, before doing the demo, I will just want to tell you that it's not a full integration. Uh, it's just a first step. As you noticed maybe this morning that we have a new chief integration officer. It means that we will push more integration in the future. And for the demo, just a few things. We spent about 10 days with Greg, so it's just the beginning. We wanted to focus on, as I said, providing tools to marketers. And also, we wanted to demonstrate the new feature of Manuela 5.3. So now I will jump in the demo. So first, uh, it's really difficult to... Where is the mouse? Okay. So first I will show you the shop as a client. Mm? Yeah, so. so as you can see, well... As you can see, you can change the language, currency, here we have a carousel showing a, a product landing page. So what is a product landing page? So basically, it's information coming from Ibris. So here you have information from Ibris mixed together with content coming from Magnolia. One thing, well, we go Greg will explain more later in detail, but there is no thing from Ibris store in the JCR. We wanted to, to try this approach to store nothing from Ibris in JCR. So here you have content from Ibris plus content from Magnolia. This is a landing page. Why a landing page? Because sometimes in your catalog you want to uh, focus on one or let's say 10 or 12 products. You don't want to highlight all, all of them, but you want to create a great experience with a few products from your catalog. Then, of course, you can anyway still browse all the catalog from Ibris, if it's working, yes. So here you have all the categories coming from Ibris. You have here um, uh, a product, a list of products. Of course, if I click on a category, I will display only the product from the category. I uh, just forgot to show you something on the page before. Of course, there is a cart also. So far, it's empty. But I can add these things to my cart. And now it should be updated. OK. So now I go again to the list. This one, the tripod, there is also a landing page for it. So if I click on more detail, I will redir be redirected to the landing page, because there is a landing page for this product. But for other products like, like this one, for instance, so here is a dynamic page with content coming from Ibris. So just to show the difference between, let's say, basic page and a landing page. And of course, you can add it to your cart. So now, OK, great. I will show you now, because we wanted to focus on, on the hipster guy, so on the marketer. So how we can create new landing page, how we can create, create new campaign for his shop. So here we created two new applications. I will first show you the product campaign. 
So as you can see here, you have two action on the left, on the right, sorry. Add product landing page or add campaign page. Now we'll show you how to easily create a new uh, product landing page. I click, I add, this is the URL. Now, as I'm a good marketing guy, I will put something like become a video producer. Yeah, almost. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> now I will choose the product coming from Ibris. This is not uh, located in Magnolia, okay. It's coming from Ibris, and I will take this product. I save, and now I have a new product. You double click. As you can see also here, you can switch to the stage catalog of Ibris. And now I will just, with flu few clicks, uh, add a new image. OK. And here you can see that you have the product coming from Ibris. And of course, the e-commerce team didn't uh, do their job, so you have to, you can change or override information directly from here. So in few clicks, I was able to create a new landing page. Then you decide to make it visible. I go back to the home page, and now it's here. It, it could it looks simple, but honestly, try to do that uh, in two minutes in Ibris is just a nightmare. So I think that marketers will uh, like more this approach of creating sites. Then there is another um, kind of, of, uh, of uh, page, campaign page, where you can see you, you just you can add more uh, product, like here I have um, a cam and a tripod. The idea here is to break categories from hybrids because maybe sometimes you want to to uh, mix together different products coming from not the same uh, catalog or, or, or categories. So here you can do that with easily with with Magnolia. And then, well, at the end, you go to your home page. And you add the campaign to your page. Well, so basically that's it. So in few clicks, you see I'm able to to create a new product landing page, to create my my own page of the shop of my shop easily, and also what I wanted to show you. The last thing is that this is using, of course, the uh, personalization feature, so now I can preview the page. So you can see that, be careful, so here you have one product, two product, and now I will, uh, oh, where is the, huh? Uh, yeah, oh, I can change the, uh, hmm? It's quite new, I never tried before. So um, it's from this morning. So <laughs> OK, so I'll try again. So I go to the page, to this, this page with Anonymous. So you can see that. And now we'll select uh, another user profile. For instance, for the Swiss market, I want to sell another combination of product. So I will select Stephanie Bowman. And now you can see that first she has, a, because uh, Swiss, they like football, so I put an image of a recent game of uh, Switzerland. <laughs> and uh, so here you can see that now there is another product associated for this offer. And at the end, I have a special offer. You can save 5% on each uh, SD card. So it's really special for the, for the Swiss market. I can feel that all the Swiss are on this side, in fact. <laughs> OK, so. That's it basically for the demo. So oh, I can close that, Greg. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so now I hand over to Greg. Thanks. And I have to. Okay, you can hear me, right? I can hear myself. So that's 
So thanks, Samuel. Um, in the coming slides, I'd like to simply highlight a few of the different integration patterns or techniques that we discovered or approached um, while we were working on this small project and how very different they are, even though they, you know, the end result is the same. You have a CMS integrating with your um, e-commerce, but the, there is a decision that has to be made early on in the project. Not all of these approaches, um, there's four, it's not going to be too long. Not all of these apply to any e-commerce solution, so that's also going to drive, obviously, the decision. Uh, if we have some time, I'll also mention a couple of other topics or points that need to be taken into account for these projects. So this is the first integration, or as I call it, no integration. Um, some sites are built like this, and what this is trying to represent is you have one instance of an e-commerce running, one instance of Magnolia, or several instances of Magnolia Public, and Magnolia is available under slash CMS or slash content, and the e-commerce web front is available under slash shop, and that's just how it is. It works. If it works for you, it works for me. Um, benefits of this, it's easy enough to implement, but that also means um, editors need to know about two completely different tools, most likely, where the products are. They probably need to figure out how to copy links from a product to a page and vice versa. It also means there's going to be a lot of redundancy, um, CSS and HTML, if you want your site to you know, look vaguely consistent, but also content because you probably want navigation to be unified across the two different sites, because there's essentially two different sites. Um, sharing assets is also going to be an issue with this kind of solution, because you'll have to, if you want to reuse a product image, you're going to have to probably just copy-paste some URLs around, and it's just going to be ugly. Um, it's not likely to provide a good shopping experience either, because you can't you know, show these kind of nice integration where you have a product link page or a product description with added content and so on. If it works, it works. Um, <laughs> it's not going to be a shop I want to go to, but, you know, for maybe a simple web shop that just sells t-shirt, maybe that's enough. I'm on the fence with this one. Um, I think it's hard. I think it's too hard to do, but some people have had great success with it. So again, if you have the right people, this will work for you. And what this is, is essentially, well, okay, I should describe it before. It's having the two systems inside the same JVM in this case. You're gonna kind of merge the two web apps if they exist as web apps. And you've seen this point before. If you've tried something, if you've tried merging big, large applications, you're gonna have class path hell, uh, Russian roulette of developers, I have that in my notes. Um, with such big systems, you're bound to be unlucky. There's going to be library conflicts everywhere. It's going to be a mess. Um, with the right people, it will work. Um, and it's likely to provide, uh, I'll come to this point later, it's going to provide good, it could provide a good integration. You can easily build uh, Magnolia apps that will show product details and so on within Magnolia. Um, but on the other hand, upgrading, uh, scaling, I already said that, end up time, yes. Uh, it's, you're going to have to go through the same cycles of upgrading all the libraries and figuring out all the conflicts every time. Uh, may seem obvious, but you're also limited to Java platforms only, whereas with other approaches, you're maybe not. Um, one tool for editors, so that's, yeah, that's the idea where you can have Magnolia apps and so on. A uh, third approach would be where you start importing data between the system, importing or synchronizing. Synchronization is hard, I think, anyway, it's a hard topic, but there are smart people that have uh, figured out good algorithms. Uh, but I see some problems with this. Data redundancy might not be a problem in and of itself, but it raises question because, well, what do you synchronize? What do you synchronize between the e-commerce and Magnolia? And then what do you publish between your author and your public instances? Is the data that you import read-only? Or do you allow editors to start writing or you know, adding descriptions or adding videos? 
do you synchronize both ways in that case? Uh, it's getting, it's just a bunch of questions that you need to answer. Um, catalog choice, what do, uh, it's again, what do you import? Which catalog do you import? Do you only do you import a different one on the public? Do you import all of them? Um, so yeah, it's hard. I think it's hard to decide or to figure out exactly what's the good thing to import. Um, on the plus side, that means you can easily remodel the data from the e-commerce for the CMS. You maybe don't need all the details about the categories. You are able to restructure how, say, the categories or the product descriptions are available to your templates, for example. And that means you obviously have one tool for your editors, because everything is going to be in your JCR, content apps, that should be easy to make. And this is the fourth approach, a remote integration. It tends to be my favorite, but practically it's possibly also the most difficult to achieve or to get to. Um, this is where the CMS is integrated via to the e-commerce only via remote APIs. There is absolutely no data that gets imported or copied between the systems. Um, that brings flexibility for developers because it's very clear um, and I'm going to say easy, meh, why not, um, to swap components at runtime or at, during development. I don't need, as a developer, I won't need an e-commerce instance running on my laptop. I can just have some fake service give me data. Um, it also means there's flexibility at scaling and deployment time. Here's an example where, for some reason, my e-commerce was not responding well anymore. I just added a few instances. I can easily scale what I want. I don't have to scale the whole thing, like possibly with the other approaches. Um, so it's possibly more work. But you get the benefits of decoupling. You can start talking about SOA to your managers and make them happy. Um, you're gaining possibilities for optimization. This might seem silly, but um, the front-end charge is only on Magnolia, so you can decide where you need more power, essentially. But you know you can cluster Magnolia or cluster e-commerce or both independently. But it also means there's a license cost that might get resolved. Um, in the scenario where you have all-in-one, as we called it, if you need to scale, if you need to cluster, you're going to have you're going to need a license for the e-commerce and a license for Magnolia if you're an enterprise. In this case, you you know, well, you're freer to not have multiple licenses for the e-commerce, for example. Um, uptime, scale, uptime scaling updates gets easier because you can update um, or scale your instances independently. You don't have to update everything all at once. Um, separation of concerns in the tools, uh, I think it's easier. If you remember the example of Samuel where he had a um, product landing page, I think, where it can be a product landing page or by default it would be just a product description page. And with this approach, I think that it's clearer for everyone that the data which is added to the page, the video, for example, clearly belongs in the CMS. Whereas with the other approaches, I think you always have to ask yourself, do I need to import it back into the other system? Do I need to use the same API to store it as the e-commerce? Do I need to invent something else? Um, one tool for editors, we've seen we have apps um, that can connect to the remote systems, display catalogs and whatnot. None of these is going to be the best. Um, it's going to depend on the project, it's going to depend on client needs, business needs. That is, you know, it's decisions. It's just a decision that has to be made. I just really wanted to picture the four different broad, um, broad approaches. Um, we think we're, we, we have a better time highlighting best practices and, and, you know, highlighting these kind of patterns rather than try with a complete, to come up with a complete framework. Um, we don't want to come up with at least not now, with, a, with our own e-commerce platform. We don't want to have a generic 
e-commerce API of sorts that would supposedly be able to talk to all e-commerce because they know that business better. Well, the e-commerce vendors know that business better than us. And it would just be a layer of complexity that I think doesn't really bring a whole lot of value. Um, so instead, we try and we hope that we, you know, with the current versions of Magnolia are able to make integration easier uh, and faster to implement. Um, that is, uh, yeah, that's it, actually. Oh, well, another thing is that we're, we've seen a lot of presentations today already and some more tomorrow about integration. It's pretty clear that at some point there's going to be reusable components that emerge from this, but um, they're not there yet, I don't think. Some other concerns uh, to take into account, um, caching is one. We had a very first naive implementation where the REST APIs were used for every request. That was obviously silly, but we wanted to see how that worked. Luckily, uh, REST lends itself well to caching, so it was easy in that case you know, to cache all the e-commerce data that we needed to cache. Um, but it is a concern to take into account early on in the project as well. Uh, random announcement, Magnolia 5.4 will help with that because it will provide the ability to cache arbitrary objects. So that means in the Magnolia cache, you'll have, uh, or you could have anyway, the, um, let's say the product details or all the catalogs and whatnot. In this demo, we implemented it with a Guava cache of sorts. Um, Magna 5.4 will also hopefully provide partial page caching or ESI of sorts, which you know, would definitely also help with these kind of integrations. Um, user information is another topic that needs to be taken into account for these integrations. If the e-commerce is essentially remote, if it's been designed to be remote, it could be fairly straightforward to have a login handler that talks to it and lets users log in. Uh, and any other information, the user's profiles would be retrieved via the remote APIs. If that's not the case, on the other hand, you're probably going to have to synchronize your user records, um, have some sort of SSO going on, things I like to avoid <laughs> personally. Uh, and session pr processes and flows is the whole question of what comes after a user has added something in his cart. Uh, what do we do when they check out? What forms comes where? Some e-commerce systems are designed such that they actually can provide this information. Um, a naive implementation would be, well, I'm just going to design, so to speak, the flow in my CMS and add a form here and have it linked to a next one and try to do error handling and validation. But the e-commerce also needs to do some validation. Uh, so if you're lucky, you have an e-commerce that has this information and gives it to you remotely. I'm not going to give any names, but I know of one that does exactly that. Um, and that's it, actually. In conclusion... <laughs> Hello? Mm -hmm. You hear me? Yes? Cool. Uh, yeah, I just forgot, in, fa in fact, something in the demo. <laughs> so I quickly switch because it's let's say, a key of the integration. So, but I'm really stressed so, and tired and I had a long, a long night, well. <laughs> you don't wanna know. So where is the mouse? Uh, I have to do that. Yeah, I forgot to mention this application because basically it's the key of the integration. <laughs> and Sasha here, he was behind that and he's looking at me since 10 minutes. Yeah, so in fact, this is uh, the new um, content app with Magnola 5.3. So if you know already Magnola 5.2 or 5.1, you could think that, yeah, okay, fine, these are coming from Magnola, but not. This information are coming from, from, uh, from, from the REST API. From the rest, through the REST API from Ibris. And thanks to that, I was able to plug it in my dialogue and so to give an easy way for the editor to, to choose a product into the Ibris catalog. So this was the missing piece. So now, for the conclusion, so yeah, well, there is no formula, as Greg uh, said, to define uh, uh, the best approach. 
always uh, business need will drive it. For instance, if I take the example of the online travel agencies versus uh, luxury, luxury goods, uh, for luxury goods, price stay always the same, quantity also, so you could say, okay, I will import all this information in Magnolia, in the JCR. But for online travel agencies, price can change every hour, so here maybe it's better to, to uh, follow the remote approach. So just to say that, yeah, it's a mix of, of, uh, of, of different approach, and also each integration is unique. So the idea of why we are here, and I will say a few things later in a few minutes, so it that for you, a good integration is in, an integration that you can do, do fast, so by reusing some pattern or some, some bricks. And so that's why we are here also, to give you these bricks. Greg, you wanted to say something about this integration pattern? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention Matteo Peluco. I don't know if he's in here, but yeah, hey. Uh, Matteo is presenting an SAP integration tomorrow, which, funnily enough, anyway, hybrids, whatever. Um, but it, it struck me because Matteo used these exact words in his abstract, how Magnolia can be the central framework for your integration project, I'm reading this, and why some Magnolia integration patterns should be your best development friends. Um, as I said before, and as you obviously know, there are many presentations about integration at the conference. That's definitely a trend that we're following closely, but it struck me that he used these words because this is the concept of Magnolia integration pattern is actually something we're hoping to um, make a little more concrete in the coming month in the form of, I don't know, documentation, blog posts, maybe fancy, fancy little cardboard things to give away. Um, Hopefully by then I'll have nicer diagrams than the ones I showed today. <laughs> but yeah. Next. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so also, well, let's say today is a day one. Things are coming with e-commerce. You can visit our site slash e-commerce. I hope it's already live. <laughs> so we will give information about this solution and more will come soon. Um, yeah, so what else can we say is that tomorrow we want to do another session about this topic because, well, we are not able to, to show you in detail what we did, and we would like also to, to uh, gather uh, your feedback and share about implementation. And the last thing is that um, we have now technology uh, partners, so it's official that we will uh, build something with IBM Smart Commerce and Broadleaf Commerce, and also more to come, but I'm not able to say anything. But so, yeah, so now it's coming. And I um, can tell you that, well, in a few months, we will come with some bricks, patterns, documentation. We cannot provide the out-of-the-box integration because it makes no sense, but we have to speed up your development. So we will come with bricks, and that will help in many cases. But anyway, for more information, you have to ask our chief integration officer. <laughs> yes, yeah, so thank you. That's it.